Hey, Ryan, how do I get project-based learning started at my school? I've gotten some form of this question nearly every day for the last decade from engaged educators just like you. So at Magnify Learning, we've created a free download to get you started. Whether you're a superintendent, principal, coach, or teacher, go to whatispbl.com to get started on your project-based learning journey today. Are you ready to bring project-based learning to your school? The PBL Simplified Podcast will help equip you for your PBL journey with weekly need-to-knows, engaging interviews, PBL showcases from facilitators in the classroom, and PBL leadership episodes to move you towards a successful implementation of PBL. Because every learner deserves to be a part of an inspiring story, and we see daily that project-based learning helps make this happen. If you want me to answer your PBL need-to-know on the podcast, visit whatispbl.com and click on Ask Ryan to submit your question. Welcome to the PBL Simplified Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Stoyer. Excited to be with you today. We have some really good stuff going on. We've got a great need to know, great main topic, and keep those need to knows coming in. Again, if you go to whatispbl.com, there's a big button there that says Ask Ryan, and you could submit your need to know. And I love it because now I'm answering your direct questions that you're asking. And in fact, it helps us produce more content for you like the new PBL Simplified book that comes out in January. You can pre-order it right now, wherever it is that you buy your books. And as you do that, you'll go through there and you'll see the structure, the six steps of project-based learning. Where'd that come from? That came from leaders just like you saying, how do I get all of my staff on board with project-based learning? Like not all of them are innovators. Now that's right, they're not. And that's okay. You don't want all innovators. You'd be all over the place. We need some to stir it up, but then you need a structure That works for your entire staff. And that's where the six steps of project-based learning come in. PBL Simplified also has two chapters just for you as a leader, talking about school leadership and school implementation. So wherever it is that you buy your books, jump on there and you can pre-order it right now or else it comes out on January 17th and you can get it then. We've got a big topic today. And then part of it will be why you'll want to make sure you're reading up on PBL. But if you're a leader doing PBL, and you're already outside of the classroom, how are you going to be an advocate? So that's going to dovetail into our main topic and also our need to know. We're going to talk about how you can be an advocate for PBL. And then we're also going to talk about in our need to know today is how do I learn about PBL if I'm already out of the classroom? So you're a leader, you were in the classroom, you did great work, you're innovative, but maybe you weren't doing project-based learning in what's coming out right now. So maybe you were doing amazing things, it was innovative, you had some voice and choice, but you're not exactly sure how to bring project-based learning to your staff because you haven't done it yourself. It's a great question. Now, it doesn't abdicate you from like learning about project-based learning, but you also don't need to have your own PBL unit like in a classroom with kids either. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. What I really advocate for leaders like yourself is get the mindset of project-based learning this growth mindset, learner-centered mindset. And those are some of the most important aspects that you can bring to your staff. And then the nuts and bolts they can get in a book or training or through the PBL Simplified series on YouTube. Like, There's a lot of ways for your staff to get the nuts and bolts. And you'll need to learn the vocabulary in those pieces as well. But the empowering mindset is so important. And the way you do that is you start to invite your staff into to be empowered to create a grassroots movement around project-based learning. And now they're starting to teach themselves about project-based learning. You're giving them opportunities. We talked about that in the last leadership episode that you're going to give them professional development opportunities around PBL that are multi-day, that are immersive, that they've got coaching sort of surrounded by that. So you don't have to have all of that right away to get going. Because if you wait till you're a PBL expert, which is fine if you did it in the classroom and you're ready to go, But if you wait till you're an expert, you may be missing the wave in the PBL movement that's happening right now. Right now, the PBL movement is we're going to get 51% of schools doing PBL by 2051. So certainly you've got time over the next 25 years, but it's also a part of your vision, I'm sure, to have your staff empowered so that your learners are empowered and you've got your vision coming to life. So you don't want to wait even longer till you can master PBL before you bring it to your staff. And you don't really need to. But if you can get the mindset down of creating a learner-centered environment for your staff, 
they'll create that for their learners. And then all the details of running PBL in your classroom, those things are there. Now, I also, obviously, I love professional development. Like, that's my world. I think it solves all the world's problems if we can just train everybody in different things. So we have district and administrative trainings at Magnify Learning. And we wrap them into a teacher training. We wrap them into site visits. And we do a lot of the mindset work. And we help you build out your vision for project-based learning. How will you support your staff? How will you be an ongoing learner? You're going to have to be a lifelong learner if you want your staff to be. And your staff needs to be so that your learners can be, right? So you're going to lead that as the lead learner. But there are definitely a ton of professional development, development opportunities for you as well. So even if you didn't do it in the classroom, you can still bring PBL to your school as the leader. And that's our need to know for today. Our main topic for today is how can you be a PBL advocate? And we need you to be, even if you're not a PBL expert. Let me give an example of where you can be an advocate for. And here's why you need to be. This may have happened to you. This may be a real life example, and you'll definitely resonate with some of it. Because structure can actually squelch the actual work, even if the people in the work are excited. So let me give you an example. Your district says, you can do whatever you want on your first staff day of the year. It's totally up to you. Plan it however you want to do it, go. So you do. You plan out this great day. You've got voice and choice. You've got time for your staff to collaborate. They get back together time. You know, they just need some time to talk. They've got work in their room time. You're about to be the best building leader that's ever been put in that position. And then you get an email that says, right from the district, it says, oh yeah, do whatever you want to do on the first day, just like we said. But make sure that you cover the district mission statement. Oh, don't forget about the new the new laptop norms, you have to review CPR, new PBIS plans. Oh, and be sure to leave room for the new insurance guy. He wants to talk to your staff too. But other than that, the first day is completely yours. Go for it. Be empowered. Like, wait a minute. I had this great day plan and now you inserted this and you inserted that. And you can see how that, those overarching structures can crush the good work that you had planned. Now that can happen in your world. It can also happen to your teachers. So our main topic for for today is that every leader can advocate for PBL by protecting these three structures. The first structure is to ensure that district initiatives don't hinder or undermine the project-based learning work. Part of your job is to protect and support PBL work. So you're kind of like this filter now you're going to go to this principal's meeting and you're going to get these district initiatives that come down to you and you have to figure out how you're going to make those work for your teachers so that they can effectively run project-based learning in their classroom. Sometimes you might need to raise your hand and, and maybe say, whoa, what about this initiative? How's this going to work for me? And if you've ever done any black swan training, great. If you go to YouTube, put in black swan negotiation, really good stuff. You might have a no-oriented question where you say, uh, I'm, I hear what you're saying with this new initiative. Do you want me to stop doing project-based learning for this year? Which would be a no-oriented question. The district person would say, well, no, we don't want you to stop that. And you can say, well, I can appreciate that, but how am I going to do project-based learning in my classrooms if I have to do this, this, and this? If it's something that really rubs PBL the wrong way, you might need to step in and, and advocate for your teachers there. But in other ways, you might just need to be more creative. For instance, if your district says every teacher needs to have an essential question up on their board. So, okay, copy that, boss. In in our world, we call that a driving question. Is it okay if our driving question fits in the essential question box? Yeah, sure. That makes sense. That works. And you start to create a PBL crosswalk of here's this district initiative. Here's how your people fulfill it through project-based learning. And if you can do that, you'll find that a lot of those best practices that your district is trying to bring in, right, with a good heart, you're probably already doing them with project-based learning or you're moving in that direction. So you might need to be the communicator that says, hey, district, we're already doing that through this portion of project-based learning. Okay, that's great. But can you find a way to protect your teachers from some of those district initiatives that can be kind of smothering to really great teaching. And you know, you know what those are. So somehow you need to have like your fly swatter that bats some of those down, some of those 
that you kind of massage and some of those that, you know, you might have to do. You're going to have to bring those to your teachers. So, but how can you ensure that district initiatives don't hinder or undermine project-based learning work? That's the first structure. The second structure where you can be an advocate for project-based learning is you allow for the freedom of when and how the curriculum is taught. So you look at your scope and sequence and say, hey, can some of these things move around? Because rigid curriculum plans and keeping all of your teachers on the same implementation schedule can start to hinder the project-based learning happening in your building. So what does that look like? It looks like in math, well, there's a lot of things that need to be taught sequentially. Right? But maybe the geometry unit can be moved around because that's separate from algebra. It doesn't necessarily build on that. Or social studies has a specific scope and sequence. But maybe those things don't need to be taught chronologically because maybe they don't build on each other. Maybe you can move them around. It doesn't mean that if you're in elementary school, you're not going to teach long eyes. But what if instead of going exactly with what was in the curriculum, what if you took those long I words and crossed them out and came up with ones? that fit your PBL unit, right? Can you give your teacher some flexibility within how the curriculum and when the tr curriculum is taught? Still gonna engage those standards. We can still take um, those tests that go across grade levels to make sure we're, we're hitting those best practices and we can help each other out in our PLCs, but is there some flexibility in how and when things can be taught? It's a really important structure that can start to smother PBL that seems like a good idea on the outside. But once you start to get into it, it's like, well, my community partner can really only come in in September. So I need to have my genetics unit up front. Can we figure out a way to move those units for me? And you don't have to disrupt everybody, but move some of those things around. So that's one that you really need to think about as a leader. The third structure that you need to protect is evaluations, your teacher evaluations. You need to look at your evaluations and ensure that they do not penalize teachers who are implementing PBL, but in fact that they're adapted to identify best practices being implemented within the PBL framework. So looking at your evaluations, is it open to growth mindset? Are you growing your teachers? And I've been pleasantly surprised in schools that I've been visiting lately that the evaluation forms in a lot of ways have in some schools made a turn for the better and that they are more collaborative. They are growing teachers, that teachers aren't afraid to try something new. In fact, they want to when the principal's in the room and they're being evaluated because then they can get really good feedback. I love the culture of that. I love it because Sometimes I'll bring this up and say, Ooh, what about your evaluations? And teachers are like, that'd be great. I'd love to try something new because then I get really good feedback. But you need to make sure that you're there, right? You might not be there on that journey yet. So you need to look at your evaluation. And the one I like to lean on is, what does it look like to have 75% of the kids in a classroom engaged? If they're engaged, does that mean they're quiet? Because that might mean that they're just compliant. And compliant and engaged are very different. That doesn't mean that the room is completely bonkers and the volume's at 120. That might mean that there's some issues, but there also might be a healthy hum, right? There might be groups that are collaborating and that's a really good thing. So you need to maybe talk with your leadership team and say, let's look at our evaluation. Is it leaning towards and making room for project-based learning to grow? Or are we squelching that in some way? Because we're giving points for, and teachers do like points, right? We know that. Are we giving points for traditional teaching? Be quiet, do these initiatives, do the things on the board, make them show these things, and then I get points. You know, the evaluation in a box, right? The unannounced evaluation comes by, so I switch gears, I pull out my box, and I do all the things that I know will check all the boxes. Versus you've got a crew that's starting project-based learning. How can we move them towards the right side of your rubric where they're doing really well and project-based learning is the vehicle to get them there. In a lot of really great rubrics that are coming out for teacher evaluation, you can't get to the far side of that rubric unless you're doing project-based learning because you're looking at student outcomes. You're looking at engaged learners. You're looking at how are learners collaborating. 
Some of those things are really difficult to do in a traditional classroom if you don't have PBL as your core structure. So the third structure you want to protect is your teacher evaluation forms. So whether you've done PBL in the classroom or not, every leader can advocate for PBL by protecting those three structures. Ensure that district initiatives don't hinder or undermine PBL. Try to allow for freedom of when and how curriculum is taught and ensure that your evaluations do not penalize teachers who are implementing project-based learning. If you can ensure and protect those three structures, have good conversations around those three structures with your leadership team, PBL has a chance to flourish in that environment. Your teachers have an opportunity to show that this is going to bring engagement, that it's going to bring rigor, that it's going to bring academic success along with the employability skill success that you're looking for for your learners in your school. And then as you have those stories that come out and the scores come out and all those things follow and trend in the right direction, then it gives you some time and some space maybe in those district conversations to say, hey, we're crushing it right now. Like, Are you sure we need that district initiative? I'm not sure it's going to help us crush it. And now you start to get to be in part of those conversations. You start to get to share some of those best practices with your colleagues. And you should be sharing and, and tuning with colleagues. And you can learn from them too, of course. So those three structures, though, if you're saying, hey, I want PBL to go well in this vision that I've put out for my people, those three things, if you can protect those, you'll put them in a really good spot to be able to do really great work. So thank you for joining me on this PBL Leadership Podcast episode. Your leadership is really important. We're going to build a grassroots movement, but your leadership and your vision do lead the way. They give us that North Star to go towards. So it's really important that you continue to hone your skills and your craft as a leader so that people are following you in the right direction. And once you do that, you'll see that you're engaging learners, tackling boredom, and transforming your classrooms. 